Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Crowd Forecast News, episode number 250 for uh, January 6th, uh, 2020. So this is the first one of the year as well. Um, so we are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of TimingResearch.com. And today we will be discussing the 328th weekly report. Uh, so if you haven't uh, had a chance to take a look at this yet, um, I just posted a link in the chat. Or you can go to TimingResearch.com slash reports to get access to either the web or PDF version. Um, and uh, just a reminder, you can also listen to all episodes as uh, audio-only podcast version. Uh, just search for Timing Research on your favorite podcast uh, network or directory and subscribe there. Today I have Neil Batho and Jim Kenny uh, here for this episode and Jim will be moderating so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay great thank you David and welcome everybody to the uh, first broadcast of the year. Uh, Neil is with us here today and uh, while many of you are familiar with Neil's work and Neil himself uh, if you could just give a quick background on yourself Neil and what you guys are doing down there and uh, and uh, anything you'd like to add in the beginning here. Yeah sure Jim uh, I was a broker uh, way back at Hard Party say it now, but 20 years ago, 98, 99, and I still remember people saying, hey, what are you going to do for, for the millennium? You know, what are you going to do? Now I think, I hear David say 2020, I think, oh my God. Um, anyway, um, so it was a, I had a great time. I loved it there because they do really well when they find come and get you to push their funds. Uh, but uh, I quit that after a year because it's really, it's just a sales job. You, you can't possibly manage uh, the money effectively for people, especially when it's time to get out. They, they kind of teach you just hold forever, uh, which is okay because they'll still tell you to hold at the very, very bottom, and that's important for people to get out. Um, but I've been writing my newsletter for quite some time now. I use a lot of the things I learned as a broker and figure charting. And uh, I also added the Ichimoku cloud a few years ago to sort of um, finely tune the entry and exit points. And so I send out a portfolio to my clients. All right, perfect. Uh, we're going to go over a lot of different information here today. But uh, the first thing we're going to do is what we always do, which is uh, ask you what you think the S&P will do uh, from today's opening to Friday. Friday's close. And just to give you a reference point, which I'm sure you already know, but for listeners here, the reference point for the um, opening here today was 32.17. So it did open lower. And as we're speaking, it has risen off of that price. But from the 32.17, um, how do you feel we're going to trade here this week, Neil? Well, I mean, obviously everybody knows what happened a few days ago. So it's very it's very difficult to, to go very bullish or very bearish. Um, but uh, I'm pretty much just going to go neutral for the week, to, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no big, uh, no big side this week. Well, if you were to say the market, that mainly, you know, equities. But yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, just on the S and P five hundred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take commodities up. I mean, we hold one of our holdings is a cotton EDS. So I think that's going to be up this week just because of the cotton market. Yeah. So, and uh, a little later in the broadcast, we're going to go around the horn on some of the things that you're keeping an eye on specifically. But these are generic questions for people that are interested in the S and P 500. Yeah. I'm just I'm just going to go 50 50. And you're not going to yeah. miss out big. Um, but don't count out a rally. All good as you rally this week. Yeah. I mean, obviously they've rallied off of the uh, low here, and it's still in a bit of a quandary because uh, some of the things uh, like. Uh, the transports and the Russell, they've taken out the late December lows and the VIX has taken out the late December highs, yet the NASDAQ and the S&P so far have not taken out that those areas. And today's low, 32, 19, uh, 17, 15 area, that's pretty much the lows of late um, December. So I think if those broke, you know, then maybe somebody yeah. would say that they're getting some evidence that a rollover is going on. Did you get that from the Stock Traders Almanac? No, About I just was looking at the chart. I was just looking at the chart because you know, um, my you know my my feeling has been uh, the short interest collapsed during this uh, run up we saw, which would let one to think maybe uh, some of this panic buying was uh, involved in short covering. And yeah, those who know anything about short covering, uh, once people have covered all their shorts, you need to find people who are now willing to be, buy the elevated prices. And if you can't, yeah. it can fall under its own weight. And I'm wondering if it'll fall under its own weight uh, here before now and the end of the week. Yeah, I'm loving your analysis. Um, um, about the short covering. I haven't uh, looked at too many, uh, the short ratio in the S&P 500. Or the yeah, if you look at SPY and you look at where the short ratio was, um, you know, two months ago, and then what it ended up at at the end of the year, you'll see a line that is collapsing down to the lowest level since October of 2018. Yeah, we need to get an intern on the show. To keep yeah, the yeah, the, yeah. The, the you know, because like I say, I mean, uh, like you say, the market does look like it has tremendous legs still. I mean, it just was getting hit and 
of course, we've had some very big geopolitical, but uh, we have not uh, seen this ability f- to keep this market down for any length of time so far. I mean, I'll never forget. I mean, I, I graduated university in 98, and I remember in the 90s, uh, you know, a, me, and my, me and a friend of mine, we hated America online, but I said, man, if I had money, I would sure love to buy that. But I have no money because I was stupid, you know, and uh, the market was going up like crazy, and uh, there was basically no war in the late 90s. The dollar was super strong, so I saw all these things together, and then I saw how things happen over the next 20 years. And so, you know, I'll never forget Greenspan's irrational hubris comment. I had to look it up. It was in 1996, uh, late, I think December 1996, the first time he used it. And it took three years and right. a month or so until the market peaked. Yeah. So I'm looking at the market now and I've never, ever <sighs> in the last 20 years seen a rally like I have in the last two months, ever. Yeah. Well, if you look at the short I'm interest chart, down. you'll see, uh, you'll get an idea where some of the buying came from <laughs> because um, clearly as this thing was going up, anybody who was short was just blown out of the woods. Yeah. And you know, I remember also when I was a broker, 98, 99, that's right at the sort of the crescendo of everything. And we were following a guy called Harry Dent. Oh, yeah, right. Called Harry Dent. And right. he wrote a book in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, what was it called? I think it was called The Boom Ahead. And he was spot on accurate in 1990. Or 1990 he right. said by 2000, we're going to have Dow 10,000. Right. But yeah. then he wrote another book called Dow The Roaring 2000s. And he was completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah. But he I, does I, a lot I, of demographic work, doesn't he? Yeah. Demographic. But one of the things I really remember was he said we have discovered a new Dow channel and so you typically have the chart goes you know from the lower left to the upper right at maybe let's say a 30 degree angle okay right. and then all of a sudden the Dow takes off and so now it's going at like a 50 degree angle and he says well this is the new channel and so now we have this new objective of something like Dow 40,000 by 2010 something like that but then now of course that didn't happen and then stocks completely crashed but now I look at the chart and I say you know what this, this looks like that new Dow channel from 1999 yeah. that Harry was talking about. And I mean, I mean, you can have an 89 degree chart and it's obviously not going to hold, you know what I mean? Right. So, well, a lot of it probably will have to do with valuations. I mean, if they key, if uh, rates ever drop down to where Europe was, which is zero, obviously uh, it's a, a valuation um, bonanza for stocks because obviously you're comparing it to a zero or negative interest rate. So if we were going to get to those levels and earnings, which this year did nothing, uh, didn't come through, uh, then you could just see a valuation uh, bubble. And uh, that would surprise people because, you know, most times if you don't have earnings and revenues, stocks can't continue up very long. But uh, if you had a valuation curveball because they drop rates so far, you know, that could be the curveball that people aren't anticipating. There's there's so many things that happen uh, compared to the past because when you have uh, the huge crescendos of a bull market, people yeah. will start talking about new paradigm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would love to just have a Google search alert thing of paradigm the word paradigm and hard you know and you'll see it making these double top and then i'll say okay keep buying now the double top break up keep buying the word paradigm you know and then maybe yeah. that will decrease a little bit and i'll say that's it get out and i swear to god at the word i can only find it out of the chart now we uh, are in the election year 2020 and we can go back to 2016 and we can go back to uh 2012 and 2008 and uh you know 04 and 2000 just to look back 20 years or so and a lot of times um, you have some pretty good size volatility right around the election time, plus or minus a year. Do you think uh, plus or minus this 2020 is going to be um, some very significant activity? Uh, I'm glad you asked because uh, just last week, uh, my new Stock Traders Almanac book showed up. And anyone who's listening to the show, I super highly recommend you order one. Uh, it costs 50 bucks online. It's done by Jeffrey Hirsch and his father started it in the 50s. And I had actually read some things about election cycles that I didn't know. And uh, some of these things are just so spot on accurate. It's unbelievable. I actually bought book 10 years ago. I hadn't bought it then, but uh, I just love it. And I'll, and I'll tell you what he says about life cycle. If the, okay, when it's a president's first out of the whole, if it's the president, a new president's first term and it's the third year, that is the best of all election cycle. And that's exactly what we had last year right. with 30% on the S&P 500. The next type, the next F is when the incumbent is running for re-election, which we have. And it's actually the fourth year of the presidency, which averages 10%. 
And the third year, which was last year, averages something like 18% in the S&P 500. And I think it was something like you had mentioned that it's actually a fairly volatile year um, in the fourth year. But when the incumbent is running again, it's better. And they didn't say Democrat or Republican. They said if the incumbent is running again. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. it was interesting what you said about the December lows, because there was also something in the almanac about if, if the lows of January reach the lows of December, you can get as much as a 10% decline in the market. But the year still ends up on a positive note. Yeah, and if I was uh, uh, throwing a crystal ball out there, I think that's something that I'd keep an eye on. Because if we do yeah. start taking out 3,200 on the S&P, a 10% correction would still only take you into the 28, 2900 area. And that's pretty much where the 200 day moving averages are and other things like that. So yeah, it's nothing, yeah. yeah. And then of course, yeah, I'm expecting um, that yeah. sometime between now and March. Yeah. Because these earnings, you know, um, uh, if they come in uh, light and the uh, guidance is not that strong uh, and profit margins are tight, you know, people are going to start looking around. And of course, if this was really a short covering rally squeeze, which there's some evidence that that could be, yeah. um, that's a recipe for a correction. And uh, that would allow people who want to get bullish uh, to uh, maybe get a better entry point. I think so. You know? Yeah. Well, we are going to ask you your confidence level, but because you're playing Switzerland today, meaning you're neutral, yeah, uh, we're no, we're, your confidence level is probably pretty high on neutral right now. I'm yeah. actually part Swiss, too, so there you go. Yeah, there you go. So um, let's turn towards, uh, you know, um, uh, some of the things that um, you're looking at as far as, uh, you know, the technical indicators. And, you know, when, when you're looking at a market, is there any uh, group of things that you like to look at, um, you know, be it moving averages, stochastics, MACD, whatever the heck they are? Uh, for the overall technicals, I, I use something called the bullish percent index. Okay. Um, if you go to stockchart.com, type in the word bullish, uh, it will measure the percent of stock in an index that are on near-term buy signals. So S&P 500, somewhere around 76% a couple days ago. Right. And in the last 10 years, or maybe ever, it's never more than 90. Because there's always going to be some weak stock in there. So right. as it starts creeping up, how many stocks are contributing to the bull market? Right. Towards the end, it's the weaker and weaker stocks, you know? that are getting picked up, right? I mean, Apple's been on a buy signal, you know, for months. Right. You know what I mean? So, but now people may take a stab at uh, Pfizer or something like that. Exactly, something like that. So as that starts going up, then once it reverses 6%, I almost just get out at least for a while. Okay. And so that, that's something you can look at. It. If it's an X's, you're in. If it's an O's, raise your stops is the best I could say. And, and you can't, and if this thing's an X's and you just stay in while it's an X's, you will never get out too early, ever. Um, because, I mean, you're not going to miss these huge rallies because you'll just look at it and say, bullish percent is still the next I can't believe this happening and you just hold you know right. but you're it's waiting hard. for the market to tell you that things have changed you're not trying to be a predictor as much yeah I mean it's really hard to time the exact top yeah. um, and following the flow of money is very important when you're investing yeah and a lot of a lot of another sign for top is a uh, buyout a lot of people say mergers and acquisitions are great and everything but I think myself well if you're using your stock to buy another company why would you do it now if you think you're talking to go up and I've seen it many times when there's a buyout that it, that's really near a top so I haven't seen yeah. many buyouts lately. Yeah. Um, with regards to other ones like the candlesticks or anything else like that or the, uh, the cloud? Yeah, I use the Ichimoku cloud and um, a good way to determine when something might move the other way is when the cloud get really, really thick as, as it expands outward. Um, that's a sign that there could be a turn soon. Uh, but what you can do if you just want to hold as a trend trader is if the daily chart is above the cloud and above the moving averages, I hold. But I'll also look for an Elliott wave for me. I don't trade specifically on Elliott Wave, but if I see three very obvious moves to the upside right. with a pullback in between, I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're on the third move. This is the last move. It took these last people forever to get in. It's got to be the top, at least for now. Yeah, at least a temporary peak. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the key questions here today that we were also going to go over is uh, platform. Uh, people like to, you know, there's so many choices out there nowadays. Yeah. Um, what uh, trading platforms and brokers do you see as uh, more favorable for what you're doing? anyway, uh, or that people could investigate? Um, well, you don't have to use an all-in-one platform, but I'm um, almost anyone who's serious uses interactive brokers, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they have something like 75% of the entire option vault in the industry. It's just- Now, on their, on their commercial, uh, they say something about elite, and then they say something about some other type of, can you, do you have any uh, quick explanation on what they're referring to, where they have the kid walking down saying, I don't want my orders uh, being traded out or whatever? I don't know. No, no. Yeah. But so I they say know. they have an elite platform and then they have some other kind of right. platform and you can switch back and forth. I don't know what that means. Well, I think when, when did Charles out? Well, 
you first you had Robin Hood that got rid of all of them, and then I think um, Schwab did it, and so now everyone's done it. Right. Amazingly, all these other countries out there are still charging commission, um, and it's hard for foreigners to open up a U.S. Uh, account with a U.S. address. But uh, beside that, um, I'm not exactly sure. I just know that they're very cheap. They've always been the cheapest. Yeah, they always have been the cheapest. best. So, but for charting, uh, there's another good one called tra tradingview.com. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like why my website, but it's a uh, trading, D R A D I N G, and then view.com. And it's all free, if, but they only give you the daily, weekly, monthly on the free version. They got an app as well. And if you pay, then you can go get down to the minute, five minute, 15 minute, you know, whatever you want, different windows, et cetera. Um, but sometimes that just gets you into trouble. Um, if you trade just on the daily, you're probably going to be okay. So, yeah. you know, once hey, you get into the five minute graphs, you're pretty much uh, jumping around uh, like a like a jumping beam. Yeah, but it's okay if you, you want to deliver a, a good entry point. Out. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people do different time frames. They'll do a, a 15 minute, 30 minute daily, you know, and move it up that way, you know? Yeah. And if you're looking at something to buy on, like, let's say something is trading below the Ichimoku cloud and you say, okay, well, as soon as it goes above the cloud, I want to be alerted. Um, you can put in something for that and it will alert you. So it will, you know, smartly monitor it. So it's not just based on price, based on the technical. So you could put in an alert and it could trigger literally a year later and you'll say, Thank oh you. yeah, I forgot about that. Okay. It will, cool. So, um, uh, turning towards some of the different stocks out there right now, Neil, is there any uh, stocks that are jumping out to you as possibly an opportunity one way or the other? I mean, this Apple is up at 300, uh, went down to 292 and changed today, bounced back up. Uh, it's got moving averages uh, well underneath the current price. Uh, you know, 219 is the 200 day and uh, we're up here at 300. So um, is this a deal where it's just a, a rocket ship going to a target price of 325 or 350, which a lot of people have as a target price? Or is it a situation where uh, it may also see a relief? I, I, you know, I just don't follow Apple that much. I think it's worth one point two trillion dollars. <laughs> Wow. It's it's too big. You're looking for more special situations than that. You know, yeah. I mean, I just a lot. Of, uh, I hear her stories from a lot of people. I wish I bought Apple and you know the crash ten years ago, and I tell them Apple. Say, I wish I bought Pier One Imports at nineteen cents, and it went to forty five. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. come on. I wish I bought Crocs at thirty cents, and it went twenty. I mean, it doesn't matter how you make the money, but God, I just kicking myself big time about Pier One Imports. I remember you know the dollar was going down that bad for Pier One Imports. It went down, down, down for so many years, and then the crash came, and I looked at it. And I said, Pier One Imports at 19 cents. Surely it would go bankrupt. And then I forgot about it. And by the time I looked again, I think it was something like 10 bucks. And I thought, oh my God. You know, so that was a, that was a classic. So you don't, you don't have to get it, uh, all in love with all. Um, but what am I looking at? I've actually been loading up on commodity the last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The commodities certainly have come into favor yeah. this year. And uh, and um, I noticed that, uh, you know, Bloomberg is coming out with some kind of an index and Vanguard came out with a commodity type fund. And so uh, it seems to me like... Like uh, the big boys are kind of indicating an interest in an area where they have not had one before so much anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I traded a lot of commodities. I remember 2003, four or five, that was every day with gold and oil, gold and oil, you know, and uh, I even bought, told my clients get into the Rogers Commodity Index. Jim Rogers had his own. I think it might be shut down now. Uh, but, you know, I've been watching some of these agricultural indexes for 10 years and never bought them one. And then I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know what, maybe now is time. People just, I mean, you tell someone and like people say, hey, you know, maybe we should get into applied materials. I think I'm going to go with cotton. <laughs> yeah. Is there a proxy for cotton on the New York Stock Exchange or do you have to trade a futures contract? No, there's, a, there's an EDF, D-A-L. D-A-L? Uh, B-A-L. Like B-A-L. And uh, that's the one that uh, they use for cotton? Yeah. I got you. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that at all. And uh, yeah, that's a Bloomberg cotton uh, sub-index or something like that? Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't know how it works. Yeah. I guess well, basically, small, you know, I, I see from the chart, it, it used to be at 48 in the last year, went all the way down to 34 and change. Now it's trading at 41 and change. So it has uh, it has turned around a little bit here. Obviously, the prices. I think there's yeah. also some opportunity in oil talk, mainly because no one really has the got to buy them. Right. Uh, so we've been in Exxon for almost a month. And the reason was because about a month ago, I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, what happened to oil stocks? I haven't traded them in forever. And then I thought, wait a second, what's the yield on Exxon these days? There's an astounding 5%. And I 
mean, who wants to make 5% a year? That's nothing, right? But then I look up uh, Exxon dividend growth rate. And in the last 10 years, Exxon has doubled its dividend. So what that means is, let's say they do the same thing again. I don't know if they will, right? Um, but let's say they do, you put, let's say you put 100 grand into Exxon, you're going to make $5,000 a year, right. right? But if they double that dividend, that means 10 years from now, you're going to make $10,000 a year, right? If they double it again, 20 years from now, you're going to make $20,000 a year, right? Based on your initial investment, you know? So there's definitely some opportunity there. You know, also in the debt market, there's a lot of uh, people who are chattering about uh, that the uh, discounted debt in the oil servicing sector, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, has been a situation where uh, people are looking as well. Uh, the bulls say, you know, that obviously you're getting great yields down there and these companies because of oil are bouncing back a little bit. And the bears are saying that uh, there's no free cash flow in the oil industry, meaning they need higher prices in order to make money because yeah. their, their companies are aren't generating free cash flow. So uh, right now, though, it does seem like the money flow has been coming into some of the uh, income things like uh, Alarion, uh, you know, multiple, uh, excuse me, uh, master limited partnerships. And uh, there has been some money flow coming into those areas and definitely in the last two months, whether they're right or wrong, only time will tell. But uh, they do have higher yields in many cases than others. But uh, yeah, you know, that's another, you know, sidebar on, uh, on the oil industry is uh, the debt. Um, with regards to uh, crude, you know, we did go up uh, pretty good here in the last few days. Do you see this as something that'll follow through, or do you thinking that uh, on a short-term basis we may have uh, run into uh, tapped out a little bit? We went to about sixty-four seventy-two today, and now we're in the sixty-threes. Yeah, my target a few weeks ago was sixty-five uh, intermediate-term target. But um, regardless of what's happening in the Middle East, I think uh, oil could hit around eighty by summer, just because for the simple reason that uh, oil has not been affected by all the inflation over the last ten years. You know, so. So mm -hmm. if you look at the price from 10 years ago when it hit, I think it hit in the sounding 145, but I might be mistaken. Do you remember? Or was it 120? It was around 140, I thought. Yeah, just for a little bit. And then, and then, but, and then it crashed down to 40, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, no, it actually crashed down to like 25. Mm -hmm. Did it? Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that can be, uh, I don't, I've been uh, talking to people for the last year about this uh, Ramco deal coming to market. I, I thought yeah. that uh, using common sense as your guide, uh, the Saudis would like to have a strong firm uh, oil market in order to sell $2 trillion worth of stock in this thing. You know what I mean? And if we went back to 40 or 45 on crude, they might not be able to sell it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, or maybe they just needed the money, you know, it's a tough hell. Yeah, I'm just saying, I don't think it's coincidental that uh, they came out with this thing and all of a sudden oil's having this big bounce, you know what I mean? Because, oh, yeah. you know, if you were trying yeah. to sell uh, stock in uh, um, in anything, you wouldn't want bad news to be out permeating uh, the air when uh, you're trying to get people to uh, invest in something, you know what I mean? So Yeah, they should have it on public 10 years ago. They would have made a lot more money. Yeah, right. Well, I'm sure, yeah, I think they're not only, they're not selling the entire company. I think it's a piecemeal deal, so. Maybe yeah. over time, they'll probably fade into this thing. And then if we go electric, you know, I went uh, down to one of the hotels uh, here in town and uh, they had a certain amount of uh, space only for electric cars. Right. And it got me thinking, you know, the electric car thing is definitely coming. But uh, I looked at the parking lot in total and it was, you know, seven or eight spots for electric and nine million for the others. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oil's still increasing in demand on the yeah. global by one and a half percent a year. Yeah. I mean, you got to dig up that lithium somehow, you know? Mm-hmm. With regards to uh, the agricultural sector, you know, you got your deal going, I guess. You got your deal going. Nothing's on writing uh, with China. And that has put a bit underneath the soybean complex, particularly bean oil and beans. Uh, but some people are saying that uh, other um, grains like wheat might come into play because of that uh, pork crisis they have over there. Um, that some sometimes uh, the money might be directed towards wheat. Uh, any ideas on what you're thinking about the grains? Well, Jim, I've got 90% of all my money in Port Oh, you do? <laughs> Leveraged it 40, 40 times. So, uh -huh. so you are, because, well, you know, there was uh, there was a swine flu. Uh, what, uh, for people who aren't familiar, a quick background on what's going on with the pork over there? I don't know. I, I just actually, the last few months, I've been actually tracking lean hogs, which I never tracked before. And I just saw it keeps reminding me of, of Dan Aykroyd and his pork allergies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a bit of a kick out of it. But uh, I don't know about lean hogs. I'm not long lean hogs. I certainly made a move, and I don't really know why. You know why? Well, I mean, no. The only thing I know, uh, what there was uh, some type of, uh, you know, a disease in their pork. And of course, uh, that is uh, a very big thing over there with regards to uh, their diets. And so uh, it, it uh, caused a lot of inflation on the price of pork, I understood. And uh, and I thought that uh, that may have an effect on um, the agricultural purchase. I had read that somewhere, whether it's going to be true or not.
not, I'm not a hundred percent, but uh, it was an interesting sidebar on it. Yeah. But um, yeah, on the on the uh, grains themselves, uh, are you are are you seeing any particular one? Corn, wheat, soybean complex? Anything uh, interesting there? Uh, we're long wheat, but we're down a little bit in the breakout. But we're still holding on wheat at the moment. But I'm not doing corn or soybeans because I can't have you know too much in all of this. Uh, but there's also a yeah yeah you're talking about as a percentage diversification of the portfolio. Yeah, I mean I'm not a big yeah. diversifier, but I mean I'm not going to put all my money in agriculture. No, you know, we still have other. Metals. Yeah. Now, obviously, the metals had the big day here today, but then uh, it seemed to back off quite a bit. Any feelings on this gold? I think we jumped almost to sixteen hundred on, uh, on on the morning or overnight session. Yeah. But um, you know, it's been kind of volatile back and forth. Huh? Yeah. I mean, gold. The move. The move started before anything happened in the Middle East, but uh, you know, and then it just you know made the move go higher. But I mean, my target for gold is possibly two thousand by summer. You know, I I see. I haven't been bullish. You know, for the long term in gold in about nine years. Yeah. I, a big balance rate at many times, uh, which worked out great. But, you know, if I look at one of the things that really triggered it, and my hypothesis of old prices isn't just deficit or how big they are, it's a deficit growth rate. Okay. So if you see the deficit getting bigger, like let's say, oh, we expected the deficit to be 1 trillion, but it's actually 1.1 trillion, 1.2 trillion. That's when gold's going to move because, oh my God, is it going to go 1.2? What's the next year going to be? 1.4? Yeah. You know, and that really triggered it back in the early 2000s. And then recently I saw that the deficit was just for the month was 12% higher than expected. And that was almost right spot on the day that gold moved. So when I saw that, I thought, okay, this is the catalyst I need, you know, and, and uh, you know, the market's at full employment and you know, the government needs all the money it can get and still can't balance the budget. I'm thinking that is, I'm thinking gold 2000. So you haven't missed out. And the Fed uh, also has indicated a, um, a willingness to provide liquidity with about a $400 billion add to their uh, balance sheet in the last few months, which is a very big spike up in liquidity. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, they did a 40% tax cut for corporations. And uh, most of that went to just buying the stock back. And uh, basically, uh, you know, that's revenue lost to the government. And if your expenditures continue going through the roof, they just passed a spending bill of about 1.4 trillion, didn't they? At the end of the year. Keep up with everything. Yeah. Oh yeah. There was a new bug. Yeah. So you got, uh, you got spending uh, pretty much, uh, you know, going nuts. And then you've got the revenues probably, uh, you know, coming, uh, coming in from a 40% tax cut. So you don't have to be uh, a CPA to figure out the math doesn't work, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I know that the U.S. had the highest corporate tax rate, I think, higher world, where you got yeah. all these big companies like Apple, et cetera, having these weird offshore shells in Ireland that own something else, another shell, and then, you know, they're sitting on billions of dollars cash, and they can't bring it on shore, and all this stuff. So, so, I mean, I'm hoping it's going to work out that the money comes back on shore, but, mm. you know, so that the corporations, I mean, if you tax them too much, they're just going to leave, whether they're physically leaving or using shell companies, you know, so. Um, Has, uh, have you been following Bitcoin at all um, in relation to the gold? Mm. Does it seem like... Like uh, Bitcoin is uh, catching a big bid, or have people uh, gone back to the more traditional uh, buy gold if you think the currency or the uh, or the economy or the debt is going to go a little nutty? Well, you're you're always going to have well, you're going to right now you have the guys that cryptos will take over the world, um, but I think that interest is fading, and you know you're not going to get as big a bounce as you think. That's what I think for now, anyways. I would stick with the traditional types of trade like gold. I mean, I did I did see a bounce on it, but yeah, you know, I think the bounces may get less and less. So Supposedly central banks have been buying the heck out of the gold too. Have you followed that at all? No, I didn't. I know that China owns a ton of gold, and I know yeah. they're buying gold. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the active there. How about on the white metal, the silver? Um, uh, cheap man's catch up trade, or or not going to really have the legs of the gold? No, I'd always follow gold. Sometimes it lags by quite a bit, um, you know. But I think you could easily have a move over up to maybe even thirty by summer. It's eighteen the last I checked. Yeah, I uh, think the last time uh, we went up towards around twenty, and that was uh, last summer. Yeah, I remember when silver hit fifty. Mm -hmm. um, it's a classic story. I went out for a walk with someone and we started talking and he asked what I did and I told him and he said, what do you think about silver? Wow. And I thought to myself, oh boy, you know, this is a guy I don't even think he trades and he knows. And I thought, that's it. And I wrote all my members and I said, get out. <laughs> I'm, not yeah. kidding. I'm not kidding. I really did. And, and then uh, about about a week or two later, I, I was at an event and the same type of thing happened. And this and silver had already gone down, you know, four. And this guy was telling me, oh no, silver, man, silver's the way to go. I'm thinking to myself, you're looking at a little silver coin. 
you think that's going to be worth more than five bucks? Seriously, you know, and and he said, no, silver's got, uh, you know, they use it in technology and it has all sorts of uses. I'm really bullish on silver. And I thought to myself, no. And then he started getting really upset at me. And I thought to myself, well, now I know I'm right. <laughs> I, I got out. Someone's going to be that adamant about something on a 20 cent pullback. I thought, you know, dude, this trade's been going on for about 10 years. I think you're kind of late. Right, so, right. Yeah. You know, one of the big things this year is supposed to be that U.S. dollar. It topped out around 99.50 back in uh, oh, the end of September, uh, beginning of October. And uh, since then, uh, we've had some deterioration. Uh, the first move down was big, uh, quick, down towards 97, snap back to 98.50. Yeah. And now we've taken out that 97 and we're trading at 96.63. You think this thing might accelerate to the downside and take out 95? Or do you think this is a little bit of a bear trap type thing? Downside, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just because of escalations in the Middle East, that could increase the risk for deficit. Deficits weaken currencies. Right. And just the anticipation of a further deficit is going to weaken currencies. I mean, people say currencies go down because of war. It's not the war. It's a deficit that the war caught, right? You know what I mean? So yeah. the, the dollar will go down in advance. And I mean, it, it's a bummer um, because the dollar is so strong. I love having a strong dollar. Yeah. Uh, but I think the pound, you could just switch to the pound. Yeah. You know? um, because basically it's like you're pulling out a big hander from that regular. And finally, you know, the UK can get down to business again, right? People will invest and they'll say, okay, finally, it's over. Oh, now I'm going to buy yeah. the recovery, you know? And yeah. it got, I mean, this is a currency that used to be well above two uh, in its uh, history. And yeah. uh, to see it down at 120 or something seemed to be a little bit of an overkill. But, yeah. you know, they had nothing but, uh, you know, uh, quagmire over there. And uh, people don't like to hold on to, uh, you know, something that uh, looks like uh, nobody's driving the bus. You know what I mean? <laughs> they get a little nervous if they're passengers on a bus that has no driver, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thing, you need to download them from uh, Elon Musk in the bus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, the administration, you know, they seem to be very friendly on having the dollar do a big fade to help international trade because I think 40% yeah. of the S&P company profits come from overseas. So they want that to happen. And then the Fed uh, wants inflation to come back. And both of those things sound yeah. awfully friendly to gold. And that's why during yeah. the drop, you know, that 1450 support zone looked like a heck of a time to uh, to come back into the game after it sold off from 1580. Yeah, I, I don't like the dollar. I was looking at it just before the show and the last few weeks, I was thinking, oh, I really hope this doesn't go down, <laughs> you know, but it looks like it probably will. And it's, a slippery, it's, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. But hasn't taken out the uh, trading range support around 95, but uh, it yeah. definitely is uh, slip sliding towards that number, it seems like. Yeah, and, and I, know, I know Trump is, I know Trump wants a lower dollar, and I think it was just a few weeks before he took the White House, he mentioned something in a few tweets, and right away, basically, the dollar went down for several months, you know. Then he talked about it again, but he just wouldn't budge, but now he might finally be getting what he wants, sort of. You know, as, as far as interest, yeah, as months. far as the interest rate picture is concerned, uh, you know, this TLT is something something that I kind of watched to get an idea of uh, what's going on with the interest rates. And, uh, you know, it uh, peaked out at about 149 last year. Uh, and then it came down and it went back up. It didn't take out 149, then came down and made another a new low down toward 135. Then it bounced up. And now it's in the 138 area. Do you think interest rates, uh, you know, this year on the 10 year note, say we're trading at 175, do you see a big move up or down there and which way? Yeah, we talked about this before. And I think that the big move for bonds was last year. I mean, mm -hmm. They had that massive bond rally and we traded it with options a couple of times. It worked out for us and even on some ETFs, leverage ETFs. And But now it's, it's sort of in a in a, in nomad land, I think, bonds. It's just people would rather be in the market. The market went up so much, that put pressure on bonds. If the market, you know, starts to sell off dramatically, you could get a move in bonds for a month or, or two. But I just don't see it unless there's a clear indication of, of interest rates. And, you know, if, if interest rates just keep, keep going down, I mean, let's say for some some strange reason the Fed loses their mind and just starts cutting rates and say they're going to cut rates more than get you know a new big bull market. But I, I'm just avoiding them completely right now. Yeah, they're trying but, to extend the cycle, obviously. But um, you would think they would be old enough to know that when you extend a cycle uh, that is this long in the tooth, yeah. that uh, at some point you're only creating a bigger problem down the road. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the more inflation, the the poorer everyone gets. Yeah. You know, in the long run, right? You got you know one income, a big house. Now you got two incomes. 
rooms and a house half the size. I, they call that progress. <laughs> uh, With regards really. to um, uh, some, you know, a handful of the uh, stocks that you're kind of keeping an eye on, do you uh, you have a few that you can share? Yeah, um, I got some commodity picks. Uh, DDC is mostly oil and gold and other things. I got DBA, which is agriculture, and we like that. And I'm looking at cybersecurity now um, as well, um, but I have not bought it yet. So I'm probably just going to hold that for my subscribers. Are you uh, man, are you monitoring any of these defense stocks? Because uh, one of the other guys who comes on quite a bit, uh, Wiz Buckley, yeah. uh, he was very keen on these um, last year. And uh, I've noticed that, uh, you know, stocks like Raytheon have had a pretty good run. They're down a little bit today, but they certainly yeah. have had a pretty good run. You following any of the defense contractors? You know, I haven't in a while just, just because there's, there's been other things to buy. But, you know, I'm aware, you know, whenever something like this happens, people go into Raytheon and they go into Lockheed Martin and some other stocks like that. So, um, definitely will be worthwhile to to look at the charts. Um, it, it's such a sketchy week. Yeah. That I don't know if I'm going to want to get into that right away. It just seems like it's just too obvious and easy. Yeah. Well, it has been. I mean, if you bought it, uh, you know, uh, last year, last month or the month before in anticipation that, uh, you know, some of these things could unfold a little bit, you certainly uh, made a hit on your last uh, couple of months equity with some of these defense contractors. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I looked up L3 Communications, but I guess I got bought out a while ago. But they're not around anymore. Do you know who bought them out? Not 100%. No. Yeah, that was that was a big one. I remember from back in the day. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, Lockheed Martin and, and Raytheon. I think those are the big ones. Boeing is also one, but it, you have as much of a business in defense. You know, at the end of last year, the biotechs were going kind of nutty, and also the medical equipment, you know, therapeutics were going kind of nutty. Did you uh, have anything in there that you've been looking at? Uh, I just have, you know, a report when people sign up for my free newsletter. Yeah. Tell them that that's on the mental pick I know of all time is uh, IHI, which is medical devices. Yeah. And it's just been doing consistently well, you know, year over year. And the medical industry is supposed to grow twice as much as the economy. So, yeah. I mean, how, you know, I don't want to say how can you lose, but it sounds pretty good to me, you know. Yeah. And so this has some interesting stock in it, like intuitive surgical and a lot of other ones. I mean, they do have high valuation. But, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, you're jumping on a train that uh, the valuations are used. Huge and it's a uh, come line betting, meaning you're betting on the future to support whatever the heck you're paying for, yeah. which can work out great. And that's where a lot of gains have. But of course, you wake up one day and if the reality hits it, uh, you know, you can get a big drop in them as well. Yeah, the train uh, left the station a long time ago, but the journey is long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And you know, he, it, uh, it left New York, but we're only we're only Detroit. We're going all the way to Texas. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. And this uh, uh, Tesla is the poster child for that because uh, uh, every time it goes down and it's left for dead, uh, it comes roaring back. And I think obviously short interest is a big factor because you know with the short interest, I think it was twenty, thirty percent of the stock or more at one point. Now it's much lower. But uh, you know, today alone, it uh, it's uh, not too far from its all time high of four fifty four. It's trading at four forty five, and uh, you know people. Uh, left this thing for dead at 150 back in uh, last June, and this Everywhere thing. Everywhere has... I go, I see more and more Teslas. I mean, I yeah. can't imagine hoarding the. Just... Yeah, I, I see more and more myself. Uh, Everywhere you know, I go, and and ordinary parking lots like at an ordinary grocery store. So you know, it's yeah. not just uh, the uh, Beverly Hills crowd that are picking these things up. You know, it seems like they've gone you know much more mainstream. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you got an extra thousand bucks a month lying around and a good credit score. You're in. I've done calculations. I mean, if you want to buy a car that's around you know fifteen twenty thousand versus is let's say 40000 for the Model 3 mm -hmm. and then you put it out 10 years how much are you going to save on gas but not only that what are you going to if you buy a car at 15000 in 10 years it's going to be worth what 3 so you're going to lose 12 there if you get the Tesla what's it going to be worth in 10 years you buy it at 40 probably going to be worth now probably literally only 15 I guess but you're, you're basically not going to have any repairs yeah. you know there's no radiator there's no muffler there's so many things it just doesn't have no alternator no starter you know all these things <laughs> sounds like everything I've had to replace in my life yeah me too I'm out <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean and then you have to go to somebody who you're believing everything they say because you have no idea how all these things work. Um, General Motors and Ford, you know, they've been real dogs. You think it might be related to the fact that uh, the world is going the Tesla way and these guys are uh, maybe are not going to have products uh, or they're going to lose market share uh, to a greater degree? Uh, I don't really have followed those talk in a while, but uh, I think they're just they're just hopeless at yeah. innovating. <laughs> they're very they're very dead. I mean, uh, General Motors has been trading between 33 and 42, and it's right now at 35. You know. 
one. Oh, why can't yeah. they make something cool? Like, remember the Saturn? That was for a while. Yeah, yeah. The Saturn was very good remember? for a while. That was kind of a, a feel-good car. Yeah. Who, who yeah. made that? I don't remember. What you I know. I think, well, Saturn, I think, had their own company. And then they got bought out. Okay. These airlines uh, got, got any future? I know they, they've they been sold off. Like, uh, Southwest has gone from 58 down to 54 here. And um, obviously, uh, they're concerned about fuel costs. Um, but every time you go to the airport, it seems like uh, the planes are full and uh, they're packed, you know? Yeah, God, you know, I have not followed airline thought of it now that you know that I wish I had. I remember looking a few months ago and I thought, oh my God, maybe I miss it even more. But uh, yeah, yeah, they're on people- the they're on the defensive well, here since the news hit because obviously people are concerned that they're going to see a 70 or 80 uh, handle that you were talking about if, yeah. if the oil started really accelerating to the upside. And then these guys may not be as hedged as they should be or something like that. Yeah, oil, oil can go up a bit. So probably that's going to put a cap on the airline thought now. Yeah. yeah, and then I think we're going to get some sort of some sort of crash in the next between now and the end of March. I don't know when, but it ha- it happens repeatedly in these types of scenarios. It happened in 2000, and what was it? Maybe 2001 also, or 2003, and then we get these March crashes. So I'm really hoping, you know, March crash, April rally, May fell off, and then maybe somewhere around June or something, we get some awesome deals, and that's going to be when everyone starts giving up. But we will have handled it properly. Yeah. Um, one last thing here uh, is on the international front. Um, uh, is there anything uh, either in Asia or in I mean, you got Australia that should benefit from the uh, turnaround in uh, commodities and uh, Canada who should turn, uh, benefit from a turnaround in some of these commodities possibly. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> you got Asia and Europe. Um, you see things overseas because a lot of people are pounding the emerging market drum and the European drum. All I know about emerging markets is that when I was a broker and I look at the holdings of emerging market EDF, oh no, I'm sorry, this is international EDF. Right. International EDF where the holdings were Coca-Cola, General Electric. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they're international, yeah. right? I mean, what other thoughts are international? They're all you had. Uh, yeah, I'm just not ready to go to these emerging markets at the moment. But I mean, if, if you short the dollar, a lot of the dollars turn again. Well, the euro is 55% of that index last time I checked. Right. But you got Canadian and the Aussie in there. And so if they benefit by the commodity and oil boom, then the dollar is going to weekend you know comparatively but i think yeah. that might be a trade future to go short dollar or you do it i'm not sure if there's an inverse dollar edf i know you got uup which is the regular one um mm-hmm. but uh, i'm gonna start looking at put on, on the dollar but if you yeah, have the, a futures contract you know you don't need the put right yeah you know what might be interesting is you, <clears throat> in europe uh, there's a etf fez for uh, proxy for europe uh, stocks uh, six, uh stocks 50 and yeah. um i know Noticed it finally got above 40, which was kind of last year's highs for a while. In yeah. fact, uh, January 2nd here, it made its uh, 52 week high. And uh, if you're a believer that Lagarde coming in is going to possibly get these people to do fiscal stimulus, and if you're a believer that uh, Boris is going to turn around uh, England and the UK, you know, it might not be uh, a terrible thing to keep an eye on uh, as well, because, uh, you know, 35 seem to be the low on this thing 40 seem to be the high and then they have been able to get above 40 uh well I'll just check to see if it's sustainable but uh you know the winds of change if they do start blowing <clears throat> i don't think those markets have advanced as much as u.s has yeah and europe's never going to be that far behind the u.s court um but i think that it could be a good time sort of switch over to europe to be honest and you know a lot of people don't realize that if you buy you know uh, a german company or a company in europe or let's say a swiss company um and those currencies go up then when you attain that like you're going to buy let's say you have a, a german uh company so what would be a, a good example maybe maybe siemens right for um so that would be in euro because their headquarters would be in the euro in a, in a country that uses euro you buy it on the new york stock exchange well, let's say the euro goes up 10 to 20 percent to gain the dollar, right? That right. will be reflected in that stock price. And when you sell it, you basically get it going back to U.S. dollars. You will actually make that money in the current. A lot of people so don't know you're, that. So you're you're thinking it's a little bit of a currency play as well? Yeah, yeah. This was huge back in the early 2000s. I mean, the U.S. was going to war, and at the same time, we had a real. Uh, I guess we had a, a guy in Canada who actually balanced the book, and, and he was like, he even canceled a bond issue because he said they didn't need the money. Oil's going through the roof and I, I told everyone if you're gonna buy an oil dog don't buy Exxon buy a Canadian oil dog and you're gonna make like 30% on the currency and on Exxon you're gonna make nothing on the currency and you gotta go with the currency play so Europe could be an awesome currency play yeah also you, you just you just you, you just mentioned the Canadian uh, energy I punched up uh, Suncor SU yeah. and I see it's gone from 27 to 34 and change um, in it's not that long of a time so there you know there seems to have been uh, since the beginning as well since uh, August uh, there seems to be money flow going towards the uh, Canadian oil company, so 
Suncor. So it'll be interesting to see if that can continue its trend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That big one in Canada. All right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna give you time, Neil, to go over a little bit of uh, reintroduction to the people that, again that aren't familiar with you, and also uh, what you're doing down the company, and then uh, what special offers or um, um, shall we say introductory offers you might have for the people. Sure. So uh, I send out uh, well, I send out a free newsletter a couple times a week, uh, just on my overall view of where you should be in the world, you know, and what sectors the sector you're in, whether it's gold or tech or biotech or whatever it is, is really the most important thing. Um, it's not to be diversified. You don't need your hands in all sorts of baskets, you know, only your hand in a couple baskets, which are the best baskets. And, um, you know, for private members, I'll, I'll send out a portfolio of exactly what we're doing, where exactly is and where I think we should be. And a lot of times we'll use ETFs, leverage ETF, and if it's time to short the market, we'll use inverse ETF, which you can use in an IRA as well, which is great. Um, yeah, and if you want to sign up, um, you know, I'll give you a report that says, uh, well, I, I actually gave it away already, didn't I? But the best ETF I think you should have for the next 10 years, which is uh, IHI. But I write some good information in there also. Okay. And uh, did you uh, tell everybody uh, what um, email address or what um, uh, what way to contact you? Um, yeah, it's it's in it's in the email that everyone got, uh, traderreview.net. Okay, traderreview.net uh, is a way to get over there and get more information from Neil. And then again, uh, any questions you have, you could also uh, obviously communicate by email as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be perfect. Okay, thanks a lot for being here, Neil. Uh, again, I'm Jim Kenny. If you have any questions on um, on getting uh, the weekly update that I provide, uh, just simply uh, email me at optionprofessor at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to keep you updated on my views and my observations. Uh, right now, I'm going to flip it back over to David. And uh, again, thanks, Neil, for being here. And of course, we'll see you some more throughout the uh, year and good luck and good trading. Thanks, Jim. You too. See you on the next show. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, lots of good info for the first, first uh, CFN show of the year. So uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory to get uh, instant updates on new episodes. Uh, you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to any of the past reports or the uh, past archives of shows. And uh, this one will be posted within about an hour. So I uh, just want to thank my guests again for today, Neil Batho of traderreview.net and Jim Kenny of optionprofessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks David. David.